and welcome everyone to our uh, 2019 lecture series here at uh, St. Veronica's via uh, Divine Mercy Care. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming, and uh, in particular, I'd really like to Saint Ver uh, thank St. Veronica's, its volunteers, um, Cherry Sherrier, uh, Shannon and Jason Brandley, who have been real warriors and champions for us in, in helping build this relationship between Divine Mercy Care and St. Veronica's, uh, to use this facility to help our inspiration aspect of our mission has been very uh, instrumental in helping us continue to do good things around that aspect of our mission. I just want to thank um, our volunteers who, who kind of day in and day out, week in and week out, have really helped this event be a possibility. Uh, Cherry Murphy, Marlene Jarris, uh, Abigail Regeria and Bobby Brennan have been fantastic in helping put this event together, and I uh, very much appreciate their work. Um, also want to recognize our Divine Mercy Care staff. Um, Mark, um, in the back here has been, uh, Mark Flores is our wonderful cameraman, but he's also our, our, our business manager uh, at, at the office. Cheney Mullins does a lot of our operations and program work. Uh, Greg Lynch is uh, here in the audience. He does a lot of our development aspect of things. Welcome, thanks for Greg and, and everything that he does. Um, for, uh, Donna Johnson is is really kind of the glue that keeps us together uh, in the office. And uh, she's, uh, she's actually back at uh, Divine Mercy Care cleaning up a few things. Um, Amy Wolf is here, and Amy is relatively new to Divine Mercy Care. She is the uh, operations manager for uh, Pro Women's Healthcare Center. And we're really blessed to have her kind of charging that, working with Christine Arcuso, who, who works out of Arizona to, to lead that, uh, our, our latest program. And that's a, this National Unity Project that we're in. And then Sharon Jong is our communications coordinator, um, writing a lot of the uh, articles that you read, whether it be in our newsletter or our annual report, uh, gathering those great stories. And Dr. B is going to share one a little bit later for you. Uh, and so we're excited to have that. We also want to thank our business sponsors. Uh, There's a group of individuals who help us uh, throughout the year, uh, Enable Design, uh, Blue Mantle Consulting, um, McCarthy and Acres, Tepiak Title, uh, and Andrew Fasaro. Uh, these, these groups of uh, sponsors are very instrumental in helping us advance our mission and keep moving forward. Um, I'd like to ask Dr. John Bachowski to come up and join us right now. Uh, you know, this is uh, 25 years of Tepiak. This is a, a big year for us, and I think whenever you can celebrate something that is instrumental, like 25 years of anything, whether that's a marriage or um, the life of an individual, it's wonderful. Come on up here, Doc. Uh, it, it's a wonderful thing, and we want we're selling, celebrating that in a variety of ways this year. These lecture series that we've got, but uh, in October we have. A, a trip to Magigoria, and Magigoria, for those of you know know Doctor's story, uh, was really a, a transformational uh, time in his life to to make that journey uh, to where he is today, and we're really excited to have him uh, and and several others join us uh, to be a part of that. So if you're interested in that, it's on our website. Uh, you can find the information, the details for that. So we'd love to have as many of you join us for that. But uh, without any more ado, my friend, Doctor. Thank you all so much. Thank you all so much for being here tonight with us. Um, this is kicking off our 2019 um, uh, um, uh, series of talks and conversations on various pro-life topics. And uh, for the next minute or two, I'd like you to I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. George Delgado. Uh, but first, welcome to the Way of the Cross. Listen very carefully. Somewhere behind the uh, air conditioning and the heater here, um, you can hear the echoes resonating from last month's our state house and the state house in uh, New York that was screaming, crucify them, crucify them. If that doesn't work, then suffocate them. So thank you to Father Kleinman and Father Wagner who um, inspire us, listen to us, challenge us here at St. Veronica's. This is the way of the cross, right? So in the middle of their Lenten reflections, every Wednesday night here at the church, they have faith, hope, and love. They're talking about those. They planted our series in the middle of that. They've graciously allowed Dr. Delgado to come speak on a very critical topic that brings together faith, 
hope, and love, not only for the patients who are suffering, but the providers who have to care for them and the communities that have to encourage them. So once again, I want to talk about this sign of contradiction that we have to be. Um, George and I have been friends, uh, we were talking about it earlier, since uh, about 2007, when they began giving us the protocol of the abortion pill reversal. And um, he has been another hero of mine, somebody who was given what the Holy Spirit presented him, took the talents he was given, both scientifically and care-wise, and began to do something new and different that can change the paradigm of health care and abortion and reproductive health in this country. And so um, this idea of giving faith to a mom who's made a challenging choice and then changes her mind, this is what this is all about. And um, before I tell this story, I just want you to know that uh, we, uh, before sharing this information, we've ran it by this patient who is now with us, alive, in our practice, who's going to be delivering in a few weeks. So this is the end or the beginning of a story that Dr. George Delgado helped provide. An unmarried young woman without family support embarked up upon the plans of her own future. She had no financial security that would permit her to undertake single parenthood. She found herself expecting a baby. Although she wasn't comfortable with the idea of abortion, her panic and her fear and her shame led her to make an appointment at the Planned Parenthood office nonetheless. She announced to the staff there that she would go home and consider her options. When no new choices presented themselves at home, she returned back to Planned Parenthood for a second appointment on a Saturday. Her strongest recollection is that the abortion pill was essentially thrust upon her almost as soon as she walked in the door. This is what's best for you. It's a woman's prerogative, tradition informs us, to change minds, as women and men often do. No sooner had swallowed the first of her two abortion pills that she began to regret it. The distress of her unplanned pregnancy paled in comparison to the distress of deliberately seeking to kill her unborn child. Urged on, the baby's daddy made a hurried series of phone calls to area medical providers to see whether the pregnancy could be saved. So, one early weekend, I got a phone call, and uh, she called the 800 number that then called Tepiak. One of our doctors are always on call, and we responded. After listening to her situation, we advised her that it could be possible to help try to save the life of her child and continue the pregnancy till birth. Although our offices weren't open until Monday morning, uh, we would schedule an appointment for her. Once again, these are the appointments that, thanks to your generosity and your love and your care, your going the extra mile inspires us. And so we called in that progesterone prescription over the weekend, and she began the protocol of Dr. Delgado's. So then it was off to the pharmacy. With a great sense of relief, she gulped down the initial dose of two prescribed progesterone tablets, took a deep breath, silently prayed that all would be well with her child and that she was so sorry. Subsequent appointments helped her obtain, through Divine Mercy Care, the necessary aid available to receive prenatal care. Meanwhile, appointments with our docs showed and continue to show that her baby was once again unaffected by the chemical she took. Not only the abortion pill, but also the progesterone. Dr. Delgado will go into that in detail. Her little son, which the sonograms revealed would be named Emmanuel, God with us. This is the hope I'm talking about. Elena's in the back. She's our phone triage nurse. 
Sharon Chang is here from Tepeyac. This is what you make possible in a doctor's office in the middle of Fairfax, Virginia, in a state that has lost its mind. Crucify them. Crucify them, but do it in your womb. So just a few weeks from tonight, little Emmanuel will be born. Still slender and radiant of face, shows few traces of her advanced pregnancy, but many indications of deep joy. I just saw her just a, a few weeks ago. I'm really glad to have found you guys. I'm really glad to have found the number. I'm so, help, I'm so happy that my baby is healthy and strong. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, this gentleman, Dr. George Delgado, um, is from Southern California. I've known him for quite some time. He um, is a part-time family practitioner. God picks the least of his children to do mighty works with the power of the Holy Spirit. It's pure grace, ladies and gentlemen. Part-time family practice doctor, part-time director of hospice services, end of life, all of you in the audience who have talked to me about end-of-life issues, he's living it. And then he runs the Institute. He's a researcher. I grew up in a medical practice that built embryos and did in vitro fertilization. This is the, almost the opposite of that. It's very healing for me, George. Because once again, I want, you to, I want him to tell you his story. He is well-trained, folks. Yes. UCLA residency and then UC Davis Medical School. He was thrust upon him this issue. And he was going to go ahead and tell you about it. And I want you to know that by combating evil, that literally is crucifying children in the wombs of their mothers, Christ is the only example we have <laughs> to combat this craziness. It's humility with a servant's heart. Jesus went to the cross for us through humility and a servant's heart. And tonight, Dr. Delgado, who has spoken in front of very small groups and groups of 65,000 people, he has testified in front of Congress and courts on this issue. He's trying to juggle multiple hats, aside being a great dad and a husband. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome me with me tonight, Dr. George Delgado. And how did all this come about? How did I get involved with this? Well, like Dr. B said, God uses unworthy servants to do great things. He got a ragtag, ragtag team of fishermen and created the apostles who were the foundation of the Christian church. I had heard about RU-46 when it was being developed before it was approved. And then it became known as Mifepristone. So it's good to know both names because the younger generation, the women who are taking this, they probably won't know what RU-46 is. But they will know Mifepristone, that's the, the name they're given. So I knew how it worked and I knew it blocked progesterone receptors. Then it got approved in our country in the year 2000. Then fast forward to 2009. By that time I was in practice in San Diego. I had been trained in NAPRO technology, which is a new women's health science that uses progesterone a lot in pregnancy to do different things to prevent miscarriages in women who have low progesterone levels, amongst other things. Well, I was minding my own business in my office, and I got a phone call from a sidewalk counselor named Terry Palmquist, in, who had taken RU46 with her and it changed her mind. She changed her mind, and she said, Terry, I don't want to abort my baby anymore. Can you help me? So Terry said, well, let me see if I can find some help for you. And Terry called me because she had called me at different times for medical advice. And she said, Dr. Delgado, can we do anything to help this woman who's taken mifepristone and has changed her mind? And I said, well, Terry, I don't know. I've never heard of anyone having done this. But I know how mifepristone works. And so it was one of those Holy Spirit moments. 
Holy Spirit had led me to study 46. He had also led me to study progesterone and napro technology. And he put two and two together in my mind, and I thought, aha. This is kind of like a threatened miscarriage, a woman who's looking like she might miscarry and has low progesterone levels. So maybe if we give her extra progesterone, we can save the baby. So I thought, well, maybe that'll work. Maybe it won't. I knew progesterone was safe, so I thought, well, it's worth a try. We're not going to put the woman at risk if we do this. Problem was, I was in San Diego. She was in El Paso, Texas. I couldn't fly out there and meet her. So I looked up on the list of NAPRO technology doctors. I found Dr. John Ellen Bellacura there in El Paso, Texas. And I called her and I said, Dr. Bellacura, hi, I'm Dr. Delgado. I have a mission for you. Are you willing to help this woman? And she said, yes, what do you think I should do? So I drew up the protocol right there on the fly. I told her how I thought we ought to dose it. We used extra high doses compared to NAPRO technology. She said, I'll give it a try. She tried it. A few weeks later, I got a phone call. Hey, she's doing great. The baby survived. A few weeks later, I got a call. She's doing great. And then later on, I got a picture of a beautiful baby girl with her mother. And she had met Terry Palmquist, the woman who had helped connect all the dots. So it's really a beautiful picture to have, and I have that in my office. That's how it all got started with me. After that, we started um, finding out more people around the country were calling us and were fi finding out about this and were asking me, hey, how did you do it? How can I do it? And I started giving you advice. And then from there, it started building. And I'll show you a little bit more of that as we go along with the story. I'm going to have a question at the, time, at the end for, for questions. So we'll have time. If there's something that I really stump you and I say something really stupid or confusing, just raise your hand. But otherwise, well, let's wait till the end of it. Before we get started with this, I kind of want to set the stage. I think overall, we really are winning the pro-life battles. We're willing, winning in the Supreme Court. It looks like we have a, a pro-life majority, and it looks like we might get another appointment maybe in the next year or two. We're winning in most state houses, where a lot of pro-life bills are being passed. And of course, the pro-abortion forces are doubling down. So in the liberal states, and unfortunately, your state is sliding into that, like New York, California, they're passing more stronger and more stringent pro-abortion laws. So we're really getting a polarized country. We have the liberals on the coasts who are very strong abortion, and we have the heartland, which is more pro-life. But most of all, I think it's important that we are changing the hearts and minds of people all over the country. And more and more Americans are starting to realize that abortion is not a good thing. And we are winning with the science. There's no doubt about that. And this is another piece of the puzzle, the scientific puzzle, showing that abortion is not good for women, showing that women do change their minds because they do regret it. And talking about changing minds, how many of you have finished high school? Raise your hands, okay. How many of you have gone to college? Okay, so we have a pretty highly educated group here. How many of you consider yourselves pretty prudent decision makers? You make pretty good decisions, what do you think? Okay, it's okay. You can be humble and, and claim that. So how many of you prudent decision makers have ever made a really big decision in your life and then changed your mind? Anybody? Most of us, right? OK, so people do change their minds. Well, shame on you and shame on all of us, because Dr. Daniel Grossman, Planned Parenthood, American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists, and all of these pro-abortion people say that women who take mifepristone, the abortion pill, rarely, if ever, change their minds. They're saying that people do not make big decisions in their lives and change their minds. They're saying that by offering abortion pill reversal, that we're imposing guilt on these people, that, that we should not be offering this. What they're saying is that they think they know better what, what's best for these women, better than these women do themselves. So it makes you wonder, if they only want one choice, if they don't want to give a woman a second chance at choice, then maybe they're not really pro-choice, right? Maybe they're just pro-abortion. So mifepristone reversal, RU46 reversal, I want you to remember three things when you leave here so you can tell all your friends, tell all the people around the water cooler, tell the people on social media that mifepristone reversal is safe, it's effective, and that women who have that opportunity are very, very happy to have that opportunity to reverse mifepristone. So let's talk about some terms first because I'm sure a lot of these terms confuse you. RU46, why does this medication have so many names? So it turns out when the drugs are developed by pharmaceutical companies, most of them never make it to market. 
And so why should a pharmaceutical company spend millions and millions of dollars to come up with a very clever sounding name when most of their drugs aren't going to make it to market, right? So instead, they'll give a developmental label. So in this case, it was RU46 because the company was Roussel Uclaf, a large French pharmaceutical giant. And it was the 486th drug in that series of drugs that they were looking at at that time. Well, when it finally came to market, they had to come up with a proper generic name, and they called it Mifepristone. And then, of course, a brand name. All drugs have two names once they're on the market. And here in the United States, the brand name is Mifeprix. You'll also notice on the, pro, um, on the Planned Parenthood website that it's called pill abortion. Often you'll hear medication abortion, medically induced abortion is a term we like to use in our research papers. You also might hear the term chemical abortion. So all of these refer to the same thing. There are other types of medication abortions. We don't have time to talk about those tonight. Tonight we'll just be talking about mifepristone, also known as RU46. So what about the abortion pill and the morning after pill? I've had medical audiences that got all this confused. So I want to talk about that a little bit. The morning after pill is a drug, usually a high dose contraceptive, that's taken by a woman usually within 72 hours of having intercourse in an attempt to avoid pregnancy to, as a contraceptive. It turns out that many times these are abortifacient, but we're not going to go into that tonight. The important thing to know is that a woman doesn't know whether she's pregnant or not. She actually thinks she's not pregnant. She takes it after a specific act of intercourse in order to prevent pregnancy. That's how it's designed. So that's why it's called the morning after pill. The abortion pill mifepristone, on the other hand, is approved up to 10 weeks of pregnancy. Okay, 10 weeks of pregnancy. It's taken by a woman who knows she's pregnant and who wants to commit an abortion. She wants to end her pregnancy, so she takes it with that intent and she knows she's pregnant and she's up to 10 weeks pregnancy, sometimes even further along than that. Two very important bottom lines, that surgical abortion, the traditional abortion, and medical abortion, mifepristone abortion, are identical in two ways. One is the preborn baby's life is ended, and two, the woman becomes a victim of the medical abortion complex. She is truly victimized, and she is the second victim, no doubt about it. But there's one very important difference between surgical abortion and medical abortion. And that is with surgical abortion, once the instrument enters the uterus, it's over. The life of the preborn baby has ended. But with medical abortion, there is a window of opportunity where she can change her mind and she has a second chance at choice and she can attempt to save the life of her preborn baby. That's the big game changer right now. And that's what we're so excited about with abortion pill reversal. So let's talk about how these things work. So everybody knows about hormones, right? You've heard of thyroid hormone, insulin, right? Everybody's heard of some hormones, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. So what are hormones? Hormones are chemicals in the body that are messengers. And they go from one part of the body to another, carrying a message. And then they land on a receptor. And that receptor, being activated by the hormone, by the messenger, then carries out the hormone effect. So that's all the hormone does. So my little, little analogy here is that a hormone is like a key. The key is the messenger, the key is the hormone. The key goes into the lock, the lock is the receptor. The key turns the lock, the door opens. The door opening is the hormone effect. That's what we want to happen. Now how many of you have the experience of putting a key in a lock that fit in the lock, but it didn't turn the lock? Anybody ever had that happen? So that's the false key. That's the receptor blocker. That's what the mifepristone does. The key goes into the lock, but it does not turn the lock, so the door doesn't open. And the door not opening then leads to the death of the preborn baby. Does that make sense how those keys work? So the receptor gets blocked by the bad key. Now, fortunately for us, it's not a static situation. Those keys are going in and out of the lock. They don't just stay there. So if that bad key comes out of the lock, and you have a bunch of good guy keys lined up, ready to go there, one of them will get in there, will turn the, key, the lock, and open the door. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to outcompete the bad guys in front of the receptor. So if we give more progesterone, more good guy keys, we're going to win the battle at the receptor, and the mif mifepristone won't be able to do its evil deeds. That's simply how this works. What are some actions of progesterone? And the name progesterone, by the way, is an acronym from the German, progestation. That's why it's called progesterone, because it's so important for pregnancy. 
progesterone does several things that are very vitally important. Even before a woman's pregnant, it leads to the maturation of the lining of the uterus, so it's a very thick, luxuriant layer, so that the, the five to seven do, day old embryonic person coming down in the fallopian tube can attach right there and lay down its roots. It also leads to development of the maternal side of the placenta, a very thin side called the decidual base alice, and it keeps the placenta well attached to the wall of the uterus, because you need to have a really good attachment so you can have the fluid and nutrition going back and forth. During pregnancy, you don't want the uterus to be contracting, and the uterus is a muscle. It's a big bag made out of muscle. So the progesterone relaxes the uterus so that it does not contract during pregnancy. You have an opening to the uterus, right? The door to the uterus is called the cervix. And the cervix is kept tightly closed by progesterone during the pregnancy like a biologic valve because that little developing baby wants nothing to do with the outside world. It's just mommy and me all the time because the outside world is bad at that point. So the progesterone keeps that cervix closed. The progesterone also causes the cells in the breast to develop through the pregnancy until finally right at the end of the pregnancy, they're ready to make milk. But in a very clever design, the progesterone causes them to develop, but it inhibits them from producing the milk because you don't want milk production when you're pregnant. You just want the milk cells ready to go. And then once the progesterone levels fall after delivery, what happens three days later? The milk comes in flowing. So a very, very elegant design that God has given us. So what does the mifepristone do? By blocking progesterone, the most important thing that it does is it causes separation of that placenta from the wall of the uterus. And what happens when you do that? You kill the preborn baby because the preborn baby no longer gets nutrition. That's the primary action that causes the abortion. It also causes the uterus to start getting twitchy and start some contractions and it starts softening and opening of the cervix, all that are prequels to the abortion itself. And by stopping the development of those breast cells, what happens there? Well, we know from surgical abortions, and we can infer here in medical abortions, that those cells, when they're developing and growing to become mature breast cells, and it's suddenly cut off, they are left in a very vulnerable state that probably predisposes them to cancer. In the United States, 30 to 45% of all abortions are now medical abortions. So that means 300,000 to 450,000 mifepristone RU46 abortions in our country every year. In some European countries, it's up to 80%, like in Scotland, 80% of all the abortions are medical abortions. So that's where we're heading, and that's where we need to focus our efforts, because these are the women who have a chance to change their course. The FDA-approved protocol is to give mifepristone 200 milligrams and 12, 24 to 48 hours later give a second drug called misoprostol, also known as Cytotec. Why two drugs? The mifepristone is very effective at ending the life of the preborn baby, but it's not so good as causing sufficient contractions to expel everything. So that's why they added on the second drug to cause sufficient contractions to expel the contents of the uterus, the remains of the preborn baby. So we have an opportunity, a window of opportunity between those two drugs. We have an antidote for the mifepristone, and that's progesterone. As of yet, we do not have an antidote for the second drug, misoprostol. That's something that we may want to research in the future, however. And we don't have time to get into that now, but we could in the question and answer period. This was our first study back in 2012. We had collected six cases of women who had attempted to reverse their mifepristone abortions. We had four successes out of those six, so this got us really excited. From here on, interest started building more and more. We set up the network and the hotline that Dr. John talked about, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Since 2012, we've grown greatly. Last month in February, there were 371 calls to our hotline. 212 were considered mission-critical women who had actually taken the mifepristone. And currently pregnant, there are about 100, and we've documented more than 500 women who have given birth after successful mifepristone reversals. So we're talking about over 600 lives saved so far that we've documented. So we're very excited about that. Our success rate, I'm going to mention a couple of times during the talk, because repetition is the mother of learning. Our success rates with our best protocols are 64 to 68%. 
We have no increased risk of birth defects in our big study. The birth defect rate was equal to that of the general population, and the preterm birth rate was actually lowered. So a lot of good things happening there. How about a control group? A control group is if a woman took mifepristone and then did nothing at all, right? That's what we call a control group. Now in our studies, we, know, we don't feel that it would be ethical to have a control group because we would be dooming those babies to die. And so we have what we call historic controls. My colleague, Dr. Mary Davenport, published this article in 2017 where she went back and she looked at all of the old mifepristone studies when they were first studying mifepristone by itself without using that second drug, misoprostol. And so what they were doing, they were trying to figure out how effective is this mifepristone at causing abortions. So the, the various studies, some of them used ultrasound to see if the baby was still alive. And then if the baby survived, they would do a surgical abortion. So the trouble with these studies, though, is some of them only waited one day to see if the baby would die. And the mifepristone actually can take more than one day. It can take a few days to, to kill the baby. And so this may have overestimated the survival rate by doing that surgical abortion so quickly. But nonetheless, we decided to use these numbers, and we came up with a survival rate of 25%. And that's what we're using in all of our studies now. And we think that's probably the highest survival rate you'll have if a baby does survive mifepristone and nothing is done. But that's the number we'll be using for comparison. Now, some of, the, some of our critics have been using numbers with what's called incomplete abortion to try to confuse things. So embryo survival is one thing. That's when we know the baby's still alive. Incomplete abortion means that the contents of the uterus have not been totally expelled. Incomplete abortion does not imply that the preborn baby is still alive. It just means that there's still something in the uterus. Even if it's just a little piece of tissue, that's called an incomplete abortion. The incomplete abortion rate with mifepristone only is 20 to 40%. That's the reason they added that second drug. So sometimes they'll say, well, if nothing is done, the baby has a 40% chance of surviving. That's not at all true. That's what the chances of an incomplete abortion. But we know that the highest survival is only going to be 25% if nothing is done. So our next study was in Issues in Law and Medicine in 2018. This is a peer-reviewed medical journal. And here we looked at a group of 261 women who had successful reversals after their mifepristone abortion. And here, like I said before, our high-dose oral protocol, the success rate was 68%, with the injection protocol, 64%. All those funny numbers under there, for those of you who are not scientific types, those just state that this was statistically significant. In other words, when we did statistical tests, we were able to prove that this was not due to chance. This really worked. So again, the survival comparison, like I said, repetition is the mother of learning. If nothing is offered to the woman and she takes mifepristone only, 25% of the time the embryo would survive at best. With our best treatments, it's 64 to 68%. So definitely a big difference there. I said the birth defect rate was 2.7%. The usual quoted birth defect rate in the general population is 3%, so no difference there. Our preterm birth rate, pre prematurity, was 2.7% compared to 10% in the general population. So a nice little added bonus there. So far, we've helped women in 45 different states and in 13 foreign countries. Talking about birth defects again, the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists, who has actually come out against what we're doing, saying that we should not be doing it. In March 2014, they came out with a practice bulletin that stated that mifepristone is not associated with birth defects. They reiterated that in 2016. Our study now of 261 successful reversals is actually the largest case series in the medical lit literature looking at preborn babies who are exposed to both mifepristone and progesterone together in, in uterus and um, proving that they're both safe. Progesterone, sometimes women ask, well, I'm going to take progesterone now. Is that going to cause a birth defect? And we're happy to say that in 1999, the Food and Drug Administration came out with a statement that progesterone and a related compound called 17-hydroxyprogesterone do not cause birth defects. And in fact, the in vitro fertilization doctors routinely put all of their pregnant women on progesterone to prevent miscarriage. Because for them, of course, their pregnancy result statistics are very, very important. And so they trust that it's very safe to use in pregnancy in all of their pregnancies. 
But we have gotten opposition from the medical establishment, like I said before, various different criticisms. They've, interesting, they contradict themselves by on one side saying that mifepristone reversal is not effective, and on the other hand saying that mifepristone doesn't really work to cause abortions anyway. They also have called what we're doing junk science. We'll talk about that a little bit. And they say that there's no proof besides our, despite our large case series. And they dismiss the possibility that a woman might actually change her mind. So let's look at the three pillars of evidence that what we're doing makes sense and works. The first is the biologic logic. Now, mifepristone was studied as an abortifacient because it is a progesterone receptor blocker for that very reason. And we know from all other biological systems that we've studied that whenever you have two molecules competing for the same receptor, when you have two keys competing for that same lock, that the one that has the highest concentration is going to win the battle at the receptor. So it makes biologic sense, right, that, that we can do this. Second, there have been animal studies out of Japan where they gave one group of pregnant rats mifepristone only. They gave the other group of rats mifepristone and progesterone, and they compared what happened. The pregnant rats who got only mifepristone, RU46, aborted all of their pups, 100% abortion rate. While the group that got progesterone, depending on the, on the doses, they either had no abortions or they had far fewer abortions. So proving there in rats that progesterone was able to stop the effects of mifepristone. And then the third pillar, of course, is our very own study now, 260 women, and our continued following of more than 600 now who've had successful reversals with progesterone. And people can and do change their minds. So when, you, when they quote their studies that are actually very biased in how they, because you know, how you ask a woman a question, do you regret your abortion? Did you wish, you wish you could change your mind? How you ask those questions can play into her denial and it can be very biased. And it turns out the literature on this, like in many other things in these areas, is very biased. And so they come up with, well, maybe 10% of women would have regrets. Other studies done by people who are less biased, like Dr. Priscilla Coleman, come up with numbers which are much larger than that. that many, many women have second thoughts. And so what I point out, though, even if we are conservative, we say, let's say only 10% of women have second thoughts and wish they could change their minds. That would be 30,000 to 45,000 women a year in our country. So that's not an insignificant number. Even if it's just a small number, even if it was just 1% and it was 3,000 to 4,500 women, why should we prov not permit them to have a second chance at choice? Why would we do that? It must be those people who call themselves pro-choice are really not pro-choice, but really pro-abortion because they don't want to give women a second chance at choice. They're only interested in one choice. That's the choice they want, and that's the choice to abort. So to conclude this part of the talk, mifepristone reversal by the use of progesterone is effective, 64 to 68%, no birth defect increase, and women are very happy when they get the opportunity. These are our protocols. We have the high-dose oral protocol. I won't go into the details on that unless somebody's interested at the end. The injection protocol. And we're going to be studying more the vaginal dose protocol and a combination protocol of oral and vaginal to see how that works. The most important thing for those of you who are involved with pregnancy resource centers is to be available. How do they find us? 95% of them is online. They do a search. They find abortionpillrescue.com, and then they call the hotline. Here's the website, Abortion Pill Rescue. You can see it has a chat session there going on and a, a very nice website. What's the APR future? So last April, Abortion Pill Reversal Program became a program of Heartbeat International. And they renamed it Abortion Pill Rescue. The research has stayed with me and to provide a forum for that research, I've developed a, an, and founded a nonprofit research institute called the Steno Institute, which will carry forward the research and the protocols. Reversing down under, the Australian Mifepristone Reversal Network was started a few years ago with our help. So they have their own network, their own hotline, their own website. In Russia, Dr. Alexei Fokin translated our protocols into Russian and started his own website. Here was an email he sent me a few years ago. Dear colleagues, my name is Alexei, and I am your colleague and MD in Russia. I've translated and posted your 
website on the Russian internet. He did this all by himself. And there's his website right there. He's helping women in Russia who take mifepristone and want to reverse it. So we're very, very excited about these grassroots efforts. Euro APR, that's our next project. I'm going to be traveling to Switzerland in June to be talking to some interested groups. There's some people there who want to start a network there so that we don't have the time zone differences and they'll be culturally more in tune with what's going on there. We're hoping to start a Latin America re network also. Right now we have over 400 doctors in our network. Our goal is to saturate the country and to saturate the world. For pregnancy help centers, they can enlist and be a hub in our system where we get a call from the client, connect that client with the pregnancy resource center, and then they can do all the counseling and carry it forth from there. Much the way all the supportive people at um, Tepiac are doing right now. We have resources for doctors and PRCs, including online help, consent forms, model orders, protocols, hotline help. And now I want to switch gears, and we're talking some about the numbers. Now I want to talk about the face behind the numbers and give you a couple of stories. So if you go to that link there, we'll see Becky's story. I discovered I was um, pregnant for the second time when I was just about 19 years old. I had had my first child at 18 years old, so the thought of having two children at 19 years old oh, so led me to believe that I needed to have an abortion um, with my second well then, child. Let's just go to the next one. This one's I visited an abortion clinic. I wasn't really told what was going to be happening to my body. I wasn't allowed to see my baby on a monitor. I was basically told that my chemical abortion was going to be quick, convenient, easy to hide, all things that I needed. And I took the first RU486 pill. As I sat outside of a Planned Parenthood clinic, literally after just taking the abortion pill, I immediately felt regret and like I needed to try to stop what I just um, started. I searched on my phone and found abortionpillreversal.com. They had a hotline number that advised anyone who had wanted to reverse the abortion pill who had recently taken it to call. After I called the hotline, a nurse answered named Debbie and she basically told me that there was still hope for me and my baby, but that I just needed to get progesterone into my body and continue with injections of progesterone for several weeks following the abortion pill. Planned Parenthood told me that this likely would not work and my child could very well be deformed. These words replayed in my head for the rest of my pregnancy. I was very scared, but after I saw my son on the ultrasound and heard his heartbeat, I was filled with hope and encouragement and I just knew that God had intervened and that I still had a chance to save my son and I was just extremely happy and grateful. I look at Zachariah and just, I am just so thankful. I feel blessed that he's here because I know that it wasn't likely that he would be, that I had tried to abort him. I just look at him and I could not imagine my life without him. What I like most about being a mom is coming home to my kids. Um, they're always so excited to see me. It's mommy, mommy, and that makes you feel so good. And just looking at them, I would never give up. They're the reason I go to school, the reason I go to work. I just have so much to live for, and I love that. Abortion is not a magic eraser. It's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And raising children, being a mom, no matter how young you are, no matter the difficulties you're going through in life, um, is still a blessing. And for anyone who's considering reversing their abortion, I would encourage you, and I would be happy to support you and walk with you and talk to you and give you the encouragement that you're gonna need on that journey. I've known many women that have regretted their abortions, but I've never known one that has regretted choosing life for their child. Because you don't. You love being a mom and you love those children once they're here.
This was a text message we got from a satisfied client. She said, hello, Liz, I just got home. Yes, I got the shot, and I'm going to return tomorrow also. I just wanted to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. You really saved me. I knew I had done wrong. It was by chance I got your number, and I am so glad I did. I feel relieved. You are my saving grace. God bless you, Liz. So I went and counted all the exclamation points. There are 28 in that text message. So that gives you an idea of how satisfied she was. Here's Father Frank Pravone and one of our abortion pill reversal babies from New Jersey. And the Seno Institute, like I said, we provide life-affirming research to our California Public Benefit Port Corp Corporation. Our mission is to conduct, promote, and educate on pro-life issues, especially initially focusing on ab abortion pill reversal and then going out to other pro-life areas. Our vision is to become a provider of excellence in pro-life research and to bring pro-life values and pro-life evidence into the public square, into state houses, into the minds and hearts of people so that we can change the culture. We're named after blessed Nicholas Steno, who was a 13th cent 17th century Danish anatomist, physician, geologist, and paleontologist. We all have a duct in our cheeks here called the duct of Steno, so he, we carry his name with us wherever we go. He later abandoned all of his scientific pursuits and became a bishop and eventually became a saint. So a great, well-rounded person. Our board of directors include Dr. Matthew Harrison, who actually performed the very first recorded Mifepristone reversal, and Dr. Derry, Mary Davenport. Our board of advisors includes Archbishop Salvatore Cordleone from San Francisco, Philip and Tiffany Rivers, Father Frank Pravone, and Charles Lamandry, who's the president and chief counsel of Freedom of Conscious Defense Fund. Our possible studies, the first one we're working on right now is a, what we call a randomized controlled trial that will pit head-to-head -head three different progesterone treatments. And the women will be randomized so that there won't be any bias in who gets what. There will not be a placebo branch because that would be unethical. Dr. Joe Stanford at the University of Utah he has agreed to be the principal investigator and he's gotten approval from his university to do that. So now we're just waiting for funding. We have a long list of other possible studies and we have some other potential basic science collaboration with Dr. Joseph Audi from the Sacred Heart University in Connecticut who's interested in what's called data mining where you go back and you look at old studies using artificial learning and you kind of troll them like you would the internet and you pull out different connections between different drugs to see if you can find, maybe for example, find a drug that could reverse the effects of misoprostol, that second drug. So very interesting things that uh, could happen there. If you're interested more in learning about the Steno Institute, you can email us at stenoresearchinstitute at gmail.com. And we'll pause there now. I think we are have time for some questions. Hi, I'm not a medical person. So, um, you said the first drug, if it's successful, it's like kind of um, takes the placenta and detaches it. So then at that point, why would it be helpful to have a pill to reverse the second one if the first one has already, um, you know, basically killed the child? That's very astute for a non-medical person. <laughs> the reason why we want to look into that is because there have been some published articles where instead of giving the two drugs two days apart, they're giving the two drugs at the same time, both at the same time. And so that may be the way they go with the protocols, and so we need to be ready for that. It turns out that the earlier studies showed that if you gave the two drugs together, it's the, not quite as effective, but there was a recent study that showed that it's probably maybe closer, the effectiveness is better than they thought. So we're concerned that they may be going in that direction, maybe in a way to stymie our efforts. So we really need to look at that second drug. Right now, we, there is a medication that's approved for dogs in veterinary medicine that does block prostaglandin, so it would help in blocking that, um, that second drug. But of course, it's not approved in humans, so we're gonna have to, there's a lot of work that would need to be done for that. So, is there a time period then that, maybe I didn't understand her question, but um, so if you get the, your, your drug soon enough, the placenta wouldn't have separated yet. 
then. So you have the 24 to 48 hours, I guess. That's right. With the mifepristone, you, you have 24 to 72 hours because that process of the placenta separating doesn't happen immediately. It takes time because you have these little molecular bonds that need to separate, and so it's kind of like slowly unzipping a zipper. It separates. So um, that's why we have that window of opportunity with the mifepristone, the RU486. With the second drug, we're not sure what the window of opportunity would be, of course, because we haven't studied it yet. But we know that we'll have some window of opportunity with that one if we ever do come up with a reversal drug. I'm thinking about how angry the other side must be that you're able to give women another chance and save their babies. Um, are they working on another drug besides, you know, okay, so we have mifepristone and the progesterone counteracts that. Are they looking, is there something else that they're gonna start, are they gonna start working on to bring forward to kill babies? So the, the pro-abortion forces probably are researching other ones because they're always looking into something new. There are other options for medical abortion, by the way. There's methotrexate, which is often used for women who have tubal pregnancies. That can also be used to abort um, intrauterine pregnancy. We have had about 10 cases of reversal attempts with that using something called folinic acid or leucovorin rescue, and we have had successes with that. Unfortunately, the methotrexate does cause birth defects. And then there, in third world countries, they often use the misoprostol, the second drug by itself for medical abortion. And that's been used for quite a few years. The reason why is that the mifepristone is a pretty expensive drug and misoprostol is very inexpensive. So yes, so we're gonna have to be chasing this probably for a long time. And even if abortion becomes illegal in our country, we'll still be looking at these other ones because they'll still have availability of these. Even mifepristone itself, it's sold under a different brand name called Corlym, K-O-R-L-Y-N, that is used for Cushing syndrome, which is a situation of excess cortisone in the body because it not only blocks progesterone receptors, it also blocks cortisone receptors. So it can be used legitimately for other things. And so even if abortion were outlawed and the mifeprix were taken off the market, that core limb would still probably be available. So they're always gonna find ways to do it and, and so we, we, we need to be there for these women because there will, if God willing that abortion is illegal in our country someday, there still will be illegal abortions and those will need to be reversed because women will change their mind because they do. And they change their minds of course because they're hardwired to nurture their young. And just like men are hardwired to protect their young. And so when you go against how you're hardwired, there's gonna be some of them who will break through that denial and will change their minds. How long is the mifepristol active in the body? What's the so the mifepristone is, the drug itself is gonna be active in the body about 24 to 48 hours. It has a half-life of about 30 hours, meaning in 30 hours, most uh, half the medicine is gone. But there are some breakdown products, what we call metabolites, because drugs, when they go into the body, they don't just suddenly disappear. The molecule gets modified by the liver and it becomes a similar molecule, then it gets modified again, and then finally it, it drifts out of the system. So probably there is active drug, active metabolite, active breakdown product, but maybe not as active as the original drug for about five days. And after three days, so it's at pretty low levels. So that's one of the reasons we designed our protocol to give the, the very high doses for three days, which is kind of the intense period, and then we drop down. I have a, <coughs> actually two questions, and the first of them is a dumb little medical question that would probably interest nobody but me. So I'm going to abandon that in favor of the second one, which is this. I tend to think, and I, I guess we all think to some extent, <coughs> in terms of uh, advocacy strategy. And when I think of that, I think of um, the thing that by you here tonight at least <coughs> hasn't yet been said, that the, the opponents of the availability and the use of the abortion reversal protocol actually are saying that 
women ought not to be allowed to change their minds. Can we go from there? Um, do you feel it takes more nerve than, than uh, is justified, in fact, in terms of how hard they might come down on you for something like that? Or is, is that a thing that you'd like to see run with in terms of advocacy? It's stern, I know. I think you're absolutely right. You're spot on that we are so far a very small movement when you look at the numbers, right? 600 lives saved out of 300,000 to 450,000 medical abortions a year. And we've just had three articles published. It's just at the very, very beginning. So why are they so upset at us? And they're very upset, they've attacked us. In fact, some of the leaders in abortion research, Donald, Dr. Daniel Grossman, one of them at UCSF, published an article that in a, in a in a, a journal called Contraception, there was a direct hit piece against us. The, the whole purpose of that article was to say that what we were doing was wrong, it wasn't based on science, et cetera, et cetera. So why are these big wigs in, in the abortion industry so upset at us? And I think it's because of what you said, because they don't want women to have a second choice. They don't want a second chance at choice because abortion is their big cash cow. Not only is it their cash cow, it's their false god. It's in a way their sacrament and their twisted look, view of life. And so if anybody acknowledges that a woman might change her mind, then we all are acknowledging that abortion isn't this great good that everybody says it is. Because if it was this great good, why would anybody ever change her mind? So that's the reason why they're so upset with us and they're going after us. So I think advocacy in, in this manner would be highly effective, and I think it would be great to advocate for a woman's second chance at choice. A woman ought to have a chance to change her mind. If she changes her mind, we're not imposing anything, we're just proposing. So she freely changes her mind, why not give her that second chance at choice? Dr. Delgado, I had the pleasure of hearing you at the National Right to Life Convention in New Orleans, and uh, I'm on the staff of the National Right to Life Committee, and I'm the state president of the Virginia Society for Human Life. Um, when you talk about advocacy, I wanted to ask you, there are five states that have legislation that's already passed. I don't think we're ready to do it here in Virginia. We've got bigger fish to fry right now, uh, but the proposal is on our state candidates questionnaire list. If a law was provided or was offered that would require information be given to patients who receive the medical abortion pill that reversal is possible that they would have to give it under state law. There are five states that have it. Have you seen any effect of those laws driving more information gathering from women in those states that have it? Are you aware of the follow-up from any of those states? Because advocacy does begin with our ability as people to pass legislation. Right, yes, and there is a movement in different states to, to do that, to have these informed consent laws. I haven't seen any actual data, but I do know that in those states it has raised awareness, so I think that's a good thing. And I think in general, you know, this is something that women have a right to know. It's part of what we call informed consent. You, know, you wouldn't do surgery on a patient without telling him or her all the possible complications. We do that as a routine part of, of medical practice. Or if there's a possibility to change, of course. You know, when you do a, um, a tubal ligation, the doctor tells this is considered permanent, but you do have the chance to reverse, and there are reversal procedures. So it's just part and parcel of the medical informed consent process. Now, when these abortion centers willfully neglect to tell them what the possibilities are, and they willfully lie about it, like they lie and say that there's no chance of, of reversing it, then that's when I think the law has to step in and set some parameters, because unfortunately they're not policing themselves. They're not following the basic standards of medical practice, which is to give the truth and to explain things before you do them and not to withhold information or to even outright lie. Is the morning after pill over the counter? And if so, is there an age group? Because your number that you're using, if it's over the counter with no age restrictions, 
because the FDA, the way they have really kind of engineered this and wanted this, it would seem that your number of, your upper number of 450 could potentially be a really low number of those using the morning after pill within X number of hours or days. So I think you're getting the morning after pill confused with the abortion pill. So remember, the morning after pill is taken with a contraceptive intent. And that's when a woman doesn't know she's pregnant and wants to prevent pregnancy. Yeah, so um, that's not something that we're reversing. We don't have a reversal for that. We have a reversal for the abortion pill, which is the Mifepristone RU46, which they take, taken by a woman who knows she's pregnant in order to end her pregnancy. So, so we have to make sure we have that clearly uh, distinguished. Now, the morning after pill is available over the counter in many states. And in some states, there's uh, a very low, um, lower age that, that, that can get it. And, and that varies from state to state. But that's, um, that's something that we're not tracking or following. I just presented that just because some people get confused between the two. So we're talking about the abortion pill here, not the morning after pill. I wonder, are there, has anyone come up with a medically accurate uh, sidewalk counselor device that you could hand, like a, uh, a brochure or even something smaller that the sidewalk counselors could hand to women coming out of abortion clinics who may have had the first dose of the pill to give them you know, some assurance that this can be reversed? Is there anything available in that area? Yes, we have lots of uh, resources available, including uh, what we call rack cards that have that kind of information and also small uh, business size cards. So if you're interested in getting that to have on the sidewalk, go to abortionpillrescue.com. And the, uh, you can also email Krista Brown, which is cbrown at heartbeatinternational.org. cbrown at heartbeatinternational.org. Or go to the website abortionpillrescue.com and you can either download or they'll send you the PDFs and you can print all the cards you want. And we encourage you to do that. Somebody who wants to take the reversal uh, progesterone would have to see a doctor in this area? They can't just uh, call and have the protocol over the phone? Yes, yeah, so we want to, from the beginning, we wanted to make sure that we followed the basic good medical practice standards. So we always made a great effort that there has to be a face-to-face -face encounter with a physician or a nurse practitioner, midwife or physician assistant. Now that doesn't mean that the patient can't start the progesterone before the face-to-face -face encounter. Because the, what we call the therapeutic relationship, the physician-patient relationship can start by telephone and that's perfectly appropriate. By telephone you can take the necessary history, asking all the questions, then you can prescribe the medication, and like uh, Dr. John said, see you back on Monday. That's perfectly fine, but we do insist that there be a face-to-face -face encounter. Now, is there a possibility of telemedicine in the future, probably, where that encounter could be via Skype or FaceTime, something like that, or some secure format? That probably will happen. And in fact, they do have these telemedicine medical abortions going on already in some states. We've been very careful, and now this is more in the hands of Heartbeat International, but when we were running the whole network, we were very careful not to do that because we didn't want to be criticized. We knew that they were going to look at us very, very strictly, so we didn't want to leave any kind of vulnerability, so we avoided that and have insisted in our protocols that uh, there be an actual face-to-face -face encounter, we're saying within 72 hours of starting the progesterone. So when these prescriptions are called into the drugstore, how much is it going to cost the woman to get this progesterone? The cost depends on what the cash price is, what the average wholesale price, all of that, or whether she has insurance coverage. Insurance coverage often covers it. When I've looked around, it's been about $2.50 per capsule. When I, I was talking to Rite Aid, trying to get ready for this study, and they quoted me a quote cash price. A cash price for them is kind of like when you go to the new car lot and you see the sticker. That's not what anybody's gonna pay, right? So their sticker price was $5 per capsule. So probably more like $2.50 per capsule and often covered by insurance. What we found is that we have not had one instance 
of a woman not getting progesterone because she couldn't pay for it. So we've had local groups buying it for her, and then the National Organization Abortion Pill Rescue helping when they couldn't find any local groups. So a lot of help has been available. So someone is interested in reversing. Um, what do they do? Where, where should they call? What should they do? Where do they go? So if someone's thinking of reversal, and they're in this area, definitely they want to go to Tepiac or call Tepiac. No reason to go through the, through the hotline network and all of that. We know we have great doctors here who are doing it, know how to do it, and have had great success. If they're anywhere else in the country, then they'll probably should just go online, go to abortionpillrescue.com, read about it there. It gives a lot of great information. And I'd welcome all of you to go to the website because it's very educational. And then they would call the hotline. The hotline would ask some questions, make sure they're definitely considering reversal, and they would connect them with a medical practitioner in their area who could help them. So that's, that's kind of how it goes. So again, to sum up, I want to just remind you and ask you to spread the word that uh, Mifepristone RU46 reversal is effective. Our success rates are 64 to 68% with our best protocols. Very safe, no risk of increased uh, birth defects. And that women who have the opportunity at a second chance and choice are extremely grateful. So please keep us in your prayers. Keep supporting Tepiac. They're doing great work. I'm very proud to be part of them with the pro-women's health care centers. And um, just uh, very blessed to be a colleague with Dr. John Bruchowski. God bless all of you. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you, Doctor. Um, one last note to, to make sure everyone is fully aware that our all pro-women's health care centers, this is a, a standard of care for them. All of them have uh, an understanding and can execute the protocols that Doctor has put in place.